Yeah, man, give thanks, give thanks. Awesome, awesome. Greetings, greetings, family. Sister Shanice in the house alongside Dr. Abu. Rise up, rise up, Dr. Abu. How are you doing today? Well, give thanks for life. More vudum. Oh, more vudum to you. Let me see if I can get some more volume over here. You're looking absolutely regal as always. Uh, family, we started two minutes late today. A little bit of a hitch behind the scenes because... Today, you know, we're actually uh, coming to you live and direct, not just from the Sister Shanice Show YouTube channel, but also we are coming to you live via the United States of Africa and the Global Pan-Africanism Network. So we're coming to you live via their stream, uh, via their website, via their Facebook. So, you know, we're looking forward to a, a bigger audience today and more interaction. So uh, keep it logs for the next couple of hours. As always, we've got a really interesting interactive so, show you know, lined up for you. Uh, I can hear some feedback, so let me just uh, sort that out right now. Excellent. I've just uh, done so. Well, family, family, as you know, I'm on the continent and we have been having our fair share of challenges regarding the internet gonna have a show tonight without any interruption at all either power outage from a poor internet connection uh, but if we if we do have any uh, poor connection issues please do continue watching because we'll be getting straight back on as soon as possible dr abu always good to have you in the house we are delighted with your return. What a show we had last strong as well. My brother, please, uh, for us. Well, we just give thanks, you know, give thanks and rise you up in that beautiful sunny Gambia, you know. We're still alive here, you know, it's it raining and, a cold, and cold, but we have to survive, you know, we will survive, you know. Yes, yes, we will indeed, most definitely. And, um, you know, Dr. Abu, I heard a, an announcement today that came out of the uh, Chamber of Commerce, and uh, they were saying that uh, they're tightening up the COVID regulations. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of what's happening there and if you're able to, um, you know, uh, tell us what's going on over there at the moment. Well, it's all about making money, you know. Mm. You can 10 years at the hotel or 10 years in prison, you know. Hey! <laughs> you see, in a, in a time like this, you know, if, if the government were true, you know, if they were true government, they would put in things to alleviate the stress from the people, but they bring on more stress on the people. Yes! Because we are... We have to be real that these modern day government does not run by the people, it run by corp the corporate, the corporate entity. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is what we call white collar crime in mm -hmm. full action. Indeed, Dr. Abu. Absolutely, indeed, agree with you on that. I can see we've got our profit back screen getting ready to join us. So we're going to bring in our brother, uh, Prophet Maduti. Rise up, rise up, Prophet. How are you doing? Yes, all the and greetings in the name of the creating force of the universe. You have nipped and been that which is greater than ourselves for as many names. Oludomare and Kulukulu, Kwame Blafo Ashe, Onyemi Ondamfo, Amenra Ashe. Ashe, Ashe, oh, rise up, rise up, uh, Prophet uh, Majudi. As always, uh, a privilege and an honor to have you on board. And, um, you know, we're uh, expecting another guest to be joining us quite soon, uh, our brother Dinah Samia. So, all being well, mm -hmm. he will be able to uh, log on uh, without any hitches as well. So, I want to rise up everybody in the chat. Uh, let's go over to the um, chat and see who we've got. And, uh, family, uh, looks like we've got 48 people logged on already. Please uh, drop us a note in the chat. Let us know where you're listening to us from. And uh, let us know, um, you know, 
give us a message in the chat. What's things like where you are? So we've got Christelle who's rising us up and she's saying hi to all. And uh, we've got Sister Verna in the house saying greetings, family. We've got Sister Afri Jamo. She's rising us up and watching from Ghana. Hey, how is Ghana right now? And uh, we've got uh, the Diaspora channel in the house as well. We've got Sister Kai. Welcome, Sister Kai. Absolutely wonderful to have you and all in the house. Sister Jamo, uh, rising you up again. She's saying, hey, I'm looking good. Thank you so, so much. It's my, you know, African colors <laughs> and, and, and et al. Thank you so, so much. We've got six foot... Six foot water in the house that's saying, uh, bro, six foot, and he's watching from Birmingham Strong. Rise up, rise up, family. And uh, we've got Brian in the house who's rising up, Dr. Abu, humble Gambian, saying hello, family. And uh, we've got uh, Rosemary King saying greetings all. Yes, greetings all right back at you as well. And uh, welcome, welcome, Sister Audrey as well, rising her up in the house. So, um, Prophet, just before you joined us, you know, I, I was uh, asking Dr. Abu just to share very briefly his views about, you know, the recent announcement that I've heard about by the um, uh, Houses of Parliament that are imposing even more restrictions on people, in, especially in terms of travel. They're saying now that those who return to the UK KK after Monday uh, are going to have to spend 10 days in quarantine in a hotel that they have selected, obviously one of their mate's hotel, that they have selected. And we've got to pay £1,700, 1700 and something, Yes, to spend 10 days in, in, in a hotel cell. Rise up, rise up. See it there on the front page of the Metro. What a thing. What do you say, um, um, Prophet Meduti? Well, you know, um, all tips is every, everything that the European does has a monetary factor to it, you know, um, um, they're very money orientated with everything that they do. Mm -hmm. It's all about money. It's not actually about the benefit of the people. Mm. Now, you're forcing people to have to quarantine. Okay, fine. But you are charging £1,700. Right. Would it not be better just close your borders? Just close your border, them. Whoever they were, them, they, they must be there until right. sometime things over. It's as simple as flipping that. <laughs> but it's always a monetary thing mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Mm -hmm. So for me, it's just a monetary thing that they're doing. Um, I'm very suspicious about these so-called variants. Um, mm -hmm. Them say them have a Kent variant. Them have a Brazilian variant. And them have a um, um, South African variant. It reminds me of that sweetie. Um, opal fruits with a whole heap of different variants. You understand, you understand me? Yes. Where does these variants come from? How have they come about? Mm. Yet you're still letting people in the country. I mean, this is absurd. Mm, mm, mm. Just mm. lock your borders, then like everybody else. Like if Jamaica and MPS can lock them border, mm. and countries in Africa can lock them border, and mm -hmm. certain parts of Europe, and then why you can't lock? What is the obsession with you opening up your borders? And you're right. supposed to be one of the most sophisticated societies in the world. Yes. It's all about money. Mm -hmm. Everything for them is for money. Mm -hmm. A huge monetary gain as well, because they're talking about, uh, you know, those of us who are returning to the UK, KK, should we decide to return during this time, having to pay 1,700 plus to stay in a hotel that they have decided that we need to stay in. Plus, you know, while you're there, you have to have another COVID test. And if the COVID test is positive, then you have to go through their NHS. I mean, this is absolutely awful. Uh, what's going on. And as you're saying, it's all about money because those tests have to be paid for. You know, the treatment's going to have to be paid for. They're going to have you locked down. Then after 10 days when you leave, they want you to then report back, I think uh, 14 days later and another period later. And again, you know, they're going to test you again. 
you know, it's all a huge amount of money that's involved. And who's going to pay for this? You know, people well, can't well, even book a return if they don't book themselves into these um, hotels, these uh, isolation centers in advance. I'm going to give. I'm going to. I'm going to give you something extra to think about, Sister Shimon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, some of the hotels them don't even hear nothing from the government about this. It's just the government come up with something, and, and the hotel mm -hmm. them I say, well, them not hear nothing from them about it. So you have all, you have all of them, 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 them little thing they are going. Mm -hmm, it's a whole, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a whole, it's a whole of general ship are going. Mm -hmm, pure mm -hmm. general ship. Mm -hmm. You see? Mm -hmm. You just said, Doctor? Yeah. What you have said is a money thing, yeah? Mm -hmm. When I met that piracy and the IC, it was a money thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you understand? So nothing changed. Nothing changed. What I'm trying to make people understand that this is what you call white color crime. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. This is the criminality of certain European tribe blood. You understand? You know? They have a, a melee. It's melee and you know, they do with it. You know, they do with this thing, you know? And ever, ever so often, them going at the... This is like a festival to them, you know? Hmm. You understand? Hmm. While hmm. it's a sorrow to that. Because they make hmm. a buck of money out of it. You understand? Hmm. So it's a coup on the poor blood. It's a coup on the poor. Yes. Yes, indeed. And uh, yeah, I agree with you. White collar crime. This is how they rake in their millions, their millions. Mm -hmm. They have identified selected hotels. Who owns these hotels? You know, what is the link to these MPs of these selected hotels? And then obviously the cost of all these tests, where is that money going? And they're also mm -hmm. proposed huge fines as well. If people, yeah. you know, fail to actually comply, huge fines, you know. So all a monetary gain. No, well, in well, no, well, Shinis, it's not fine. Them are saying no. Them say if people don't mm -hmm. let them know where them where them come from. It's ten years I'm a lot of people up in a jail. Hey. Ten, ten years. Ten years. In mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where they will make more money from them while they're mm -hmm. in jail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see my, you see my uh, David. Yes. Yes. What a thing, what a thing. The whole thing says, if you can work from home, you can work from jail. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> you see, you see uh -huh. the, um, people of the world, and we know that the world is watching what we're speaking about. Yes, that's true. Remember that you are the majority. The people mm -hmm. them that govern the country are the minority. Yeah. You, the people, are the majority. You can dictate the parameters of your governorship. These oligarchs, these wealthy people, these people them that has acquired intergenerational wealth from stealing, robbing, pillaging, Mm -hmm. has continued that throughout generations. Mm -hmm. And they continue that until now. And what they are quite clever at doing is turning the ordinary citizens of planet Earth against each other. Mm -hmm. And so we have bigotry people about the place who just eat African people just because we're here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they use those people as well as the collaborators and the collaborators within our um, race to work with them. Mm -hmm. It's a bunch of little elites, you know, working together. That's right. And we must That's never, right. ever stop asking the question, how is it that a virus that you supposedly can wash your hand for 28 seconds and destroy it as the entire planet locked down? <laughs> That's the question that we need to ask. And you're mm -hmm. building a vaccine fit. Why would you need a vaccine for, so, um, for something where you can wash with an and soap and them something there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see, because what tends to happen, Dr. Abu and Sister Shanice, is that these little finites get lost in the melancholy of all the other news. You understand what I'm saying? So oh, now, yeah. 
They have never spoken about the amount of people that was dying of flu. Hmm. And when we look at the statistics, their own statistics, the amount of people that supposedly died of COVID is no more than people that die of flu around about the same period. Right. If there is a pandemic, if there is a pandemic, if there's mass hysteria, mm -hmm. how is it we don't hear fire engine and we don't hear um, sirens for um, ambulance and all them things that are run right. up and down the street day in, day out? How is it when right. we got the hospital the other day empty? Right. Uh, how that? Right. How is it there's not police that say, listen, you can't come in, the, the, you know, the beds are over full? No. They are doing a mass experiment. Mm -hmm. No, people of the world, I don't have no evidence to prove what I feel. But I know within myself and in my innermost being, and because of the experience with these people, they're doing a mass experiment. And that experiment prim primordially is to eliminate African people first and foremost, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then eliminate the wretched of their own society who they deem mm -hmm. as the wretched. Because if they were listen, let me tell you from Illiver London, there's no there's no lockdown in London. A lie them I tell. Mm -hmm. Me just coming from work, come here for work, me for go drive a van and thing. And the people them I run up and down a street, see them where. Over and clap them and all them. Anywhere the white people them there, when you go down there, a pure of them out on the road. Yeah? Huh. No uh -huh. lockdown and then away. Huh. Lie them, I tell people. Uh -huh. Maybe they've locked down the clubs. They probably locked down some casinos, wine uh -huh. bars, and um, small businesses. But Wait Rose is open. Sainsbury's is open. Asda, Morrison, Liddell, Aldi. Them all do. In fact, Tesco, in fact, their yeah. profits is more than any time before. Right. Yeah? Yes. Yes. I, I see, so we have a brother coming. So make we hear from the brother. Introduce him, not Sister Shinis. Rise up, rise up, Prophet. Yes, uh, we have Dino Samir in the house. Uh, he's our guest joining our panel today. Uh, had a little problem uh, getting on, but we're delighted that you have now managed to join us, uh, Brother Dinah. So rise up, rise up yourself. Oh, now you've joined us. I seem to have lost our Brother Prophet. Oh, great. He's he's black with us. Okay, so what I'm going to do, uh, family and friends, I'm just going to, um, you know, rise up the family. Then I'm going to introduce our panel member, and we're going to be kicking off with our topic for discussion. So, you know, we were just uh, talking about some of the issues that we talk about in our homes you know, right about now, about what's going on regarding COVID-19 and the new laws and regulations that they're implementing. And now, you know, basically it seems to be a, the money thing that's driving, you know, this whole agenda. But as you know, we can talk about that for the entire show. And all of this, you know, is just completely sidetracking us from the growth and the development and the rise that's happening on Mama Africa land and that was happening prior to COVID-19 actually striking uh, in the heart of, uh, of, of Africa's development. So, you know, we're going to go be going back to our um, agenda. So I want to rise up, rise up the entire family that's locked on. I hope that each and every one of you rose this morning in power, that you rose in strength and that you rose with a, a commitment to achieve much today and, 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 and an attitude to accomplish much because none of us are here forever. But for while we are here on this earth, each and every one of us has a job, each and every one of us has a role and a responsibility to ensure that we are contributing towards the growth and the development of us as a people and to Mama Africa. So uh, tonight we're not only streaming on the uh, Sister Shanice Show channel on YouTube, but we're also streaming live via the United States of Africa, Facebook and Twitter page, and also uh, via the Global Pan-Africanism Network. So we wanna thank our brothers uh, for hooking us up 
uh, on that stream as well. And, uh, you know, looking forward to our discussion today because we're going to be talking about Mama Africa and how we, as the diaspora, can contribute to the growth and development of Mama Africa. Now, uh, some of you may be regulars here on the channel. We might have some new people listening in as well. I noticed we've got uh, viewers from Lesotho. I've seen Luton in, um, from the UK, from various cities in the UK. I think we've got people logged in from South Africa, various countries around the world. Uh, Ghana is locked in in the house, you know, so Yes, there's Lesotho, I can see uh, there. So wherever you're listening to us from, we thank you so, so much. Bermin Strong, you know, lots of the UK in the house. So some of you may be very familiar with the uh, panel members and some of you may be new to our panel members. So I'm just going to do some introductions and, uh, and then ask each of our panel members to introduce themselves uh, to you today. And then we're gonna go into our discussion. Thank you, family, family. So um, let me just uh, open up. Uh, here we go. We have in the house our brother and regular panel member, Dr. Abu. Uh, Dr. Abu is a community activist. He's also a volunteer, youth worker, and community counselor. He's a dub poet, an artist, uh, does arts in mirror design, and he's a presenter on the Big G Galaxy Afiwi, the only D brainwashing station. And uh, you can get his shows on a Sunday from 8 a.m. through to 10 a.m. And you can also get him on a Monday evening and a th th Monday afternoon and a Friday afternoon as well from 3 p.m. Uh, through to 7 p.m. He's also a management committee member on the Big G Galaxy Afui. And for those who are not familiar with Big G Galaxy, it's a Pan-African-centered radio station here in the UK, KK, okay? And uh, also um, our other regular uh, panelists tonight we have is our brother, uh, Prophet Maduti, whom we affectionately know as Prophet Kwaku or Prophet. He's also a presenter on the Big G Galaxy FWE. You can get him every Thursday inside the Nubian Forum People's Talk Show from 9 p.m. through to 12 a.m. Uh, and he speaks about anything and everything that relates to us uh, as Africans globally. He teaches at the Nubian Africa Community Foundation Saturday School that's been running for over 30 years and uh, it's an African-centered school. He's also a community activist, former co-chair of the African Emancipation Day Reparations March Committee, popular UK stand-up edutainer on the black comedy circuit. He's also a photographer, works alongside ADE Photographic Services, sharp photography in print, videography. He's a painter and decorator, and his main passion is African liberation, psychologically, culturally, philosophically, spiritually, technologically, economically, politically, and prefers to talk about Africanism as opposed to uh, Africanization as opposed to education. Rising up, rising up, Prophet Maduti. And uh, our guest for today as well, new to uh, our regulars, is our brother Dinah Samir. Those of you who are regular followers of YouTube will be very familiar uh, with our brother Dinah's huff. He has a wealth of videos out there. And uh, his name is Dinah Abefi Adewali Amai. And uh, he's a dynamic, globetrotting entrepreneur. And uh, just realized my thing's going low, low battery. Let me make sure that... Uh, uh, we don't lose um, power. Okay, so um, yeah, he's a dynamic globetrotter, entrepreneur, and philanthropist who has a passion for life and seeing the success of others. Dinos was born in Albert Horton uh, Hollis the second in uh, Sacramento, CA, but considers himself a displaced African who just happens to be born in America. He attended a Christian Brothers High School in Sacramento, where he would star in track and football, earning first team parade and USA Today High School All-American Honors in Football. After graduating from Christian Brothers, he would uh, then take his talents to University of Georgia. He would uh, then after going to track and football and graduate with a degree in agricultural business. 
Uh, after a short stint in modeling and acting, he would take his talents to corporate America. Uh, Dynas would finish in the top 10% in sales for two Fortune 500 companies organization, Aflac and Sintas. And this culminated with him finishing number one in the entire sales organization at Sintas Corporation in 2014. In 2018, uh, Dynas would leave corporate America to take his talents to Africa to focus full time on implementing several much needed initiatives geared towards improving infrastructure on many levels as well as bringing, uh, bridging the gap between the diaspora and Africa. Dynas is also a published author, philanthropist, and currently serves as the Omo Oba, Prince of Yoruba of uh, Oro, Oro in Nigeria, and encourages everyone to come and visit the kingdom of Oro. Uh, don't mind the grind, he said, grind means constant struggle. There's no need to grind when you are walking in the blessings of our life each and every day, Dinas and Mir. I'm going to zip it now, family, because I'm gonna go around the table and ask each of our guests, starting with Dr. Abu, to give us a few opening remarks and then we're gonna go into topic. Dr. Abu. You never you never highlight um, Maduti. Oh, I did. You did. Did you miss it? Yes, yes, that, I did. That, that goes so quick, you know. <laughs> well, give time. You missed time. it. Did you hear it, Prophet? Yes, mom. Here, 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 here. Yeah, man. You sure you never jump asleep? Oh, no, 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 <laughs> no, I never jump asleep. I think, I think it's brother Amir, um, artifact that really all me. They're wonderful, you know. Oh, yes. You, yeah. uh, you know, welcome, my brother. Yeah. Thank you. you know, Prophet Quaker, you know, and the family, you know. I hope we can go through some reasoning and bring out some solution. Vudum. Thank you. For real. Vudum, Dr. Abu. Prophet Maduti. Um, I'm just going to give way to my brother because he just, he just come in and we were speaking earlier. So I'll give way to my brother and let him speak. Wonderful, wonderful. Rise up, Prophet. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Brother Prince Dinis Amir, indeed an honor and a pleasure to have you join our panel today. Beautiful artifacts that you've got there. You know, uh, some of our guests may know you, some may not. Please just, uh, you know, introduce yourself and uh, tell us a bit about who Dinis Amir, Prince Dinis Amir is. I see my sister Kai in the chat room from Dinis Four Channel. Yeah. <laughs> yes. my yeah, so um, I'm Prince Dinis Demir. Uh, I run a platform entitled In Search of Uhuru. And what we're doing, we're building a bridge between the diaspora and Africa. So uh, that's my platform. To learn more about me, you can go to dynastamir.com and, you know, all the different brands and information that, you will, that you'll need will, uh, will all be uh, located there as well. Yes, and uh, Brother Dinus, um, you're an author. I don't know if you have any of your books to hand that you might want to just share with us. Yeah. I know you've only got the first hour, so we want to give you a little extra time today. So uh, please do plug your books, uh, etc. All right, so this is the first book I ever written. This is my sales book, uh, Sales Motivation 101, Get Off Your Ass and Cold Call. Um, so the, I wrote this book back in 2011, I believe. And then this is one of many of my children's books. Uh, Kinky Hair is Quinley Hair. Uh, also, I author Kinky Hair is Kingly Hair, uh, Amina's Third Eye, and several other children's books. And you can pick all of those up at dynastamir.com. So. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, Brother Dinis, I mean, you have traveled Africa quite extensively. And uh, so, you know, have, so have other members uh, of the panel here. But we're going to start with you because our big question today is, how can we, well, how can the African diaspora contribute towards Africa rising? Brother I Dinis. I would say the uh, the skills that you've developed, that we've developed, uh, you know, whether you're in the UK, whether you're in France, whether you're in America, 
uh, taking uh, those skills and implementing them in Africa, uh, I think that's number one. Those see, you know, I, I, I've told people that, you know, we spend our best years, most productive years building up the West. But then, you know, I hear a lot of my elders saying, I'm going to retire in Africa. Or I hear a lot of people say, well, once I finish and I clock these amount of hours at my corporate job, you know, at my corporate this, then I'm going to retire in Africa. So we want to build up the West, complain about the West, complain about our condition in the West, you know, but then we want to retire in Africa. So mm -hmm. I think the shift, and, and the shift is happening, um, because when I first started on this journey in 2011-ish, um, you know, I would say the black man and black woman who were in corporate America, Africa was the furthest thing from their mind. Mm -hmm. But now, um, you know, speed up to 2021, but even back in like 2018, I started hearing more from people in corporate America you know, who were like, look, you know, even though I'm making uh, a lot of I'm making good money, I'm bringing a good income. I have great benefits. I have a great retirement. But I've hit that glass ceiling at my job. Uh, there's no investment at my job. I'm being disrespected at my job. Uh, I just got laid off from my job. Mm -hmm. I put in, you know, this amount of years at my job and they let me go. You know, they tell us we have to give them two weeks before we leave, but they fire us at any time. Um you know, I, now I'm considering Africa. So I think where we're at now, it's about building up Africa, taking those skills in Africa, giving Africa your best life, uh, your best years. And then we'll start to see Africa rise as we collaborate with those on the continent. Most definitely. Um, uh, can you put your information in the chat as well, a uh, link to your website so that people know where they can go to get a copy of your book uh, and where they can go to find you? Absolutely agree. You know, um, Africa certainly shouldn't be seen as a place of retirement, but a place where, you know, we can give the best of our years and our working life. And, you know, it certainly is uh, a, a better place. And, uh, you know, I've got some statistical information that I'm going to introduce into the, to the topic for discussion today as well. But um, before I do, let me um, ask our brother, Dr. Abu, who has also traveled um, Africa as well, to um, share with us um, his points of view on the same question. Dr. Abu, is there a role for us as the diaspora uh, in Africa? Uh, and co in terms of contributing towards the rise of Africa. What say you, my brother? Good on family. As, as you say, Good areas that in Walter Rodney, or Europe underdeveloped Africa. You know? And what what brother Im Amir was saying, it, the, 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 the skills that we have, you know, we have to take, take them back through the lens of Africa, not through the lens of the European. You know, we have, to we, have to take, we have to take them back in a collective way. You know, we have to take them back in our mindset, just like what Aga is doing in the Gambia, just like what Galaxy is doing here, and Brother Amir, that's not what um, Prophet Maduti is doing with the Nubian school and you is doing the in the Gambia sister she needs. What I'm saying that we got to move to Africa in a collective way because they did take us out in, in a packed in like sardine blood. You know, we cannot go back to Africa as an individual, as a tourist. Because they're just going to see us as a tourist. You know, we have to organize ourselves, you know, and it's not, you know, it's not a matter of going back to Africa to friend up these ministers and all of these things. No, it's to demand. It's our right. It's our right. I'm not, I'm not into going to Africa to beg and all of these things. No, we are going there to claim our right and to invest in our motherland. That's how I see it. That's simple. 
Rise up, rise up, Dr. Abu. Uh, let's go over to our brother, Prophet, and uh, please share with us your thoughts uh, regarding the contribution that you think we, as the diaspora, can make towards Africa's rising. You know, um, Sister Shanice, I think one of the things that has been missing is a concept that the Africans in the diaspora has played no part in elevating Mama Africa. And that is so incorrect. If you mm -hmm. speak about the Africans, especially with reggae music, who were instrumental in singing songs about the liberation of Africa. I learned about Africa through African music, reggae music. Is reggae music make me know about Africa? You know, Burning Spear, Mighty Diamonds, Culture, you know, and then Monday, we my little boy I grew up because we didn't get that tourist talk to us in school. Mm -hmm. um, there was a few elders, a Rasta man them, one namely elder by um, Parky that would teach us a little bit about Africa. But in knowing about Africa, we learned it mainly from mm -hmm. reggae music. True, so true. reggae music was instrumental in making the African world aware of Africa and about repatriation, etc. So that is a history that is important to make sure that those of us who are alive and our children to come are aware that we ne Africa, them took they, they took us from Africa, but they couldn't take Africa out of us. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Mm -hmm. And so the Pan Africanist movement in the diaspora, in in the the Americas in the carriers beyond and in Europe played a heavy part in keeping Africa alive in the diaspora and Africans and going over to Africa to mm -hmm. the work. What a lot of people don't know, you say a man like Louis Armstrong, Louis Armstrong a big land in Ghana till to, to today now. Louis Armstrong was, the man that was in the mm. 1920s and them things, the man that was going to Africa and trying to develop Africa from them the time that till now. You know, our great Marcus Mazaya Garvey, and many, many more. So, what we have to do coming, I'm, I'm fast forward to now, there's a lot of Africans, like my brother Amir was saying, that are skillful in, um, in economics, that is skillful in architecture, that is skillful in engineering, mathematics, the sciences. But what they tend to do is work for the systems that they are, the colonial systems that they live in. So, for example, we have brilliant African minds here, but they don't work for the benefit of Africa. They have brilliant African minds in the US, but they don't work for the benefit of Africa. They work for the benefit of the systems that continue to steal and rape our resources, manufacture mm -hmm. them, and then them sell them back to us for extraordinary um, prices. The GPS system by an African-American woman. But who is it for? It's for the benefit of the, um, the United States. The laser-guided missile technology was created by a, sign, a Ghanaian scientist who worked for the, for the, um, the US. Yeah, the internet system, the, math, the mathematical equations behind that was created by, in fact, a Nigerian that went to um, the United States to continue the knowledge base. So, so, so we have it already. What we need, as Dr. Abu said, we cannot go back to Africa with a singular mind. We've got to go with a collective mind, first and foremost. Secondly, we must not go there thinking that we're going solely to teach the Africans on the continent something, like there's nothing for us to learn from them. We come with something oh, we know, see. and they're going to teach us with something they know. Because people in Africa are still creating things. The, 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 the capacity to invent stuff has never dwindled. It is there. So all we have to do is work with our brothers and sisters in Africa to develop Mama Africa. And lastly, what I would say to my brothers and sisters in Africa, when you see us come there, don't see us as a money machine. Don't treat us with contempt 
and try to rob us and um and steal and con us because we have to talk the truth. That is what going in Africa. It's just like the Caribbean. They see us come there and they think we're wealth and money. Some of us we come with our last of dreams and dreads and money and we try to do our thing. Work with us. Don't treat us like the enemy. That's all I have to say for now. Rise up, rise up, Prophet. Rise up, each and every one of you, for uh, the first round of contributions. They have to agree with all of what's said. And, uh, you know, just looking at the comments that we've been getting uh, in the chat as well. Absolutely agree. Um, you know, we have to go with a collective mindset, not an individualistic mindset. Absolutely critical. Because there's so much that we can do in our syndicate groups, uh, in our families, and our families may not necessarily be blood relations. It could be the galaxy family, or, you know, it could be, you know, the, the school or the college that you went to and all your friends from that grouping. But any trusted family, any trusted group is about us pooling our resources, pooling our finances together and going over and making a contribution towards the development. There's a lot already happening on the continent. Absolutely agree, Prophet. You know, that it, you know our, our musicians, our artists, our poets, you know, dub poets have for decades you know, been singing to us and keeping, you know, the spirit of Mama Africa alive in us so that, you know, there would be a day when we would want to return. And that day is now and there's a movement definitely happening. And despite the efforts of the West to give us the impression, you know, that Africa is the pit of hell. No, no, no. We've managed to keep that dream alive. And uh, what they have managed to keep from us, though, is the wealth of Africa. But those of us who are, you know, out there in the forefront of this movement, I want to rise everybody up for the great works that you're doing in your respective positions in highlighting and exposing the truth uh, about what's going on in Africa, especially those of us in the West who have access to a lot of research documents, a lot of information from here, and are sharing it, sharing it with our brothers and sisters on the continent. Let me give you a little example of what was written in this report here. It says that, um, yeah, I'll, I'll get the uh, report as I go through. In 2012, uh, the recorded data of developing countries received a total of 1.3 trillion including all aid investment and income from abroad okay so they're calling africa and the likes of developing countries and they're saying that we received 1.3 trillion in aid and investment basically from the west the so-called developed countries but in that same year some 3.3 trillion actually flowed out from the so-called developing countries. In other words, Africa and the developing countries sent two trillion more to the rest of the world than they actually received. It's actually a deception, you know, to suggest that Africa, you know, is dependent on the world. The reality is that the, the West is dependent on Africa. And if we look back, it said in this report, to all of the years since 1980, the net outflows actually added up to an eye-popping 16.3 trillion that had been drained out of Africa's economy economy to the developing countries over those few decades. And that basically gives us a sense of the scale of the extent to which Africa is actually propping up the West. But what we're saying is, as a people, it's time for change. Okay, it's time for some of those funds to be invested back in Africa. And there are those of us who are out there organizing trips so that our brothers and sisters who haven't been to Africa can actually go and see the beauty of Africa for themselves. I want us to just talk about the beauty of Africa. I just want us to talk a little bit about how welcoming and embracing Africa is. You know, hopefully those statistics addresses, you know, this myth and this misconception that Africa's poor. Africa's not poor. Africa is wealthy. Some of the people may be poor because of the institutions, the corporations, and the organizations that exist are draining Africa because these monies are going into those corporations and being siphoned out of Africa. But I'll park that for a while. Let me just let me just hear my brothers talk about the beauty of Africa and any trips that they've organized or got organized. Brother Prince of Dinosaur. 
over to you. You've traveled Africa extensively. Is it the impoverished image with flies <laughs> that they try to give us the impression Africa is like? What is the real Africa really like, please, Dinis? Oh, man. So I just got back from uh, Sierra Leone. Um, January, well, I went to Sierra Leone, then I went to Ghana, Togo, and uh, Benin Republic. And so I just returned from that trip uh, last month. Mm-hmm. And I tell people, Sierra Leone is the most beautiful country that I've ever stepped foot in. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am Sierra Leonean, uh, by the way, as well. Um, and it's just, you know, when you, when, you, when you think of Sierra Leone, they just sell us these images of civil war. You know, and then I remember the first time I went to Sierra Leone, I went to Liberia, Liberia, beautiful country as well. Um, so the the way the airplane, I'm sorry, the airport is situated, it's on like an island. Sorry about that. It's on like an island. Uh, so you have to catch a ferry uh, from the island to the mainland. And so I remember walking out the airport and, you know, and then we catch a cab to the uh, to the ferry, and I remember when I get on the ferry and we're approaching the uh, the mainland. I'm just like, oh my god, it's so beautiful. It's the you see the green, just mountains. Um, you know, they say Sierra Leone, if Nigeria and the Caribbean had a baby, you have Sierra Leone. Uh, and then the <laughs> are just just beautiful. It's serene. Uh, the landscape is just beautiful of the country. I mean, it's like God blessed. I mean, God blessed Africa, but God like blessed uh, Sierra Leone. Uh, it's just really? it's an absolutely beautiful country. Um, but I mean, that's all of Africa. And again, it's just even with the amount, uh, I mean, we have our smartphones, but, you know, people who, you know, waste their time watching nonsense on their smartphones, they turn into a dumb phone. Uh, you know, even though we have access to all this technology, you know, you still have people uh, who use these 1970s and 1980s uh, stereotypes to justify not going to Africa 2021. Uh, you know, they believe what the media tells them instead of them researching uh, the truth, which is available, you know, they were rather just leverage these old stereotypes but i mean africa is beautiful it's gorgeous in fact we're doing a tour to sierra leone april uh 21st through the 30th we're going back to sierra leone i'm taking uh, people with me so if you guys are interested in joining uh hit me up go to dynastamir.com send me a message and yeah i love to take you guys to the uh to the continent but it's i mean it's it's stunning it's stunning it's absolutely beautiful and I was in Gambia uh, back in December, and you should have saw the amount of white people in the Gambia. <laughs> you know, you know, it, it is just our people. You know, they're they're they like here in America, our people. They're going to, I guess, a new popular spot is Tallinn, Mexico, and they're going to Greece, and they're coming to Europe. Meaning, me. Meanwhile, white people are coming to Africa, so. You know, it's just again, God bless our continent, and God definitely bless Sierra Leone. So, so yeah. Oh wow! I think you've just sold us Sierra Leone, uh, Prince Diana Samir. I mean, it's like, is this for real? This is certainly not the image that we're shown on the television. Right. Exactly. It's wow. For real. Sounds like somewhere to go and see, definitely. So hook up Dinas uh, for that trip. And, uh, you know, is it, and it's definitely going ahead despite this, despite this COVID madness, yeah? It's open. I mean, the only people that are locked down are you guys in the UK. I mean, everybody else is open. <laughs> is it only the UK yeah. that's locked down like this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. the UK oh, wow. is that's locked down. But uh, we're, you know, every, everywhere else is open. Like I said, I just got back in January. So I was there. Uh, I went in December, came back, then went back again in December, and I just recently came back in uh, in January. Yeah, there are you have your protocols where you have to take your COVID test on arrival and before you leave, but for the most part, it's. I mean, you wouldn't even know COVID is in in, in Africa until some some places you have to wear a mask when you enter. But outside of that, I mean, everybody's out, and 
and about. So, like I said, I think the UK is the only place that is true, like on uh, lockdown right now. Mm, 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 mm. Rise up, rise up. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Dinus. Oh, my days, just UK on lockdown right now because we had a couple of trips planned to Africa ourselves last year that we had to cancel. We had one planned to Zimbabwe and we had another one planned for Tanzania. And uh, we had to put both of them on hold, unfortunately, and still not in a position to set a new date for those trips because, you know, it seems like every day there's another new law that's coming out uh, by the British government that's trying to make life hell for, for the people in the UK, KK. But Dr. Abu, you joined us on our trip uh, last year, a no, year before now, to Zimbabwe. There may well be a number of people in the chat who've never visited Zimbabwe. Please share with us, what's your experience of Zimbabwe? And, um, you know, what opportunities are there for the diaspora, in your opinion? Well, again, you know, if we, if we follow their propaganda, we, we wouldn't even head to the airport. Hmm. Right. Uh, you know, when we was going to Zimbabwe, they tell us that there was strike, fuel shortage, nothing in the supermarket. And when we got their sister Shanice, hmm. to see like that they were they, they were telling. You understand, you know? Yes. Because Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe to me is one of the most honest country. You know, many time I misplaced my phone and somebody run me to give me my phone. You couldn't do it amongst this <laughs> in, 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 in European tribe. You know, what we are saying, right? <laughs> What we're facing is, yeah. is colonialism. It's a colonial virus that affecting us. If you see what we were doing before this pandemic, we were shouting Africa rising. We were moving our people in from A to B, doing certain things. This is part of, of the counter it. It's what they're doing to counter it. A lot of us sit here and we we surprised and we wonder why some African is taking boat to come here, but there's gonna come a time when we have to go wonder how we are taking boat to leave here. You understand me? You know, because they do not want us to develop and they don't want us to leave. And the only way we can resist all of this tyranny, because it's a tyranny, you know. We in a disconcentration camp, and if we don't organize ourselves, Mm -hmm. You understand? Because as I said, we are in a state of willing and able. There's many who is willing, but they are not able. And those who are able, they are not willing. And we just see it, we see it a couple of weeks ago amongst those um, able, um, able body who is not willing to do things for their people. We see, we see the example. You understand? So we have to realize that Africa is beautiful, you understand, you know? Africa welcome us, you know? But I would want to say more welcome come from the authority because a long time we day I cry for Africa, but these government in Africa, it seem like they might lock them foot blood. And as I said, I now beg, I now beg no government in Africa don't place in Africa. It's my right. And if me a fight, if me a fight the European for my rights here, you understand? I will go to Africa and I will fight for my rights here. You understand? You don't see it. And this way it's all about because as the Rasta man said, debt to black and white oppressor. And that's how I see it. Vodum. Vodum, rise up, uh, Dr. Abu. Thank you so much uh, for sharing there. And yes, indeed. Wow, wow, wow. While they were writing in the newspapers that the supermarket shelves in Zimbabwe were empty, we were in and out those same supermarkets and, and the shelves were packed with food. I mean, they will write all sorts of crap to put our people off from going to Africa. But as you're hearing, family, it's absolutely beautiful. I'll share some more stories about Zimbabwe as well in a little while. Uh, Prophet, another man who has traveled Africa, uh, please share with the family who are locked in right now, uh, Prophet, your views of uh, Africa, maybe just select somewhere to speak of, and, uh, you know, the opportunities that are there, my brother. 
You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna come from a, a different aspect of Africa. I'm gonna come from a more spiritual aspect of Africa. Uh -huh, that's good. Cool. You know, my, I'm an African coming via Af I'm from Africa via the island of Jamaica, the Britain. I've been to Jamaica many times. I've been to other Caribbeans and islands and they're beautiful, beautiful scenery. And I love it. And whenever I've got to come back to England, there's a bit of depression in me. Right. I know that feeling. Mm. What was that question? I said, I know that feeling because I have that yeah. same, I feel the same way yeah. when I'm coming back to America. Yeah. But when I go to Africa, and when me have to leave Africa, my bar like baby, <laughs> and I know a joke thing. There's, there is a feeling I cannot explain that resonates in me. It's like it's like I'm, it's like a belong there. You understand me? There's a spiritual energy that resonates through my aura. And every day I wake up, I wake up with a smile. So from a spiritual aspect, Africa is definitely our own. There are many opportunities. Uh, I'm involved in a project in Ghana. Unfortunately, the project was set to have other Africans involved in it from a communal point of view. What we have discovered, there's a lot of people sing about Africa, but when it comes to working towards going to Africa and working as a collective, people decide that they want their own local peace somewhere else. It's, it's almost like we've lost that, that sense of community, being a part of. We've um, adopted this Eurocentric mentality, mine, I want to own it, mine, instead of ours, we, let's do together. So we hit a rock and a hard stone with that project. We still have the land, it's still there. And we're still inviting our people to come. And we've had people come and they um, end up being just like the Europeans and and some of them in agent farm to destroy what we're attempting to do. But there's opportunities for young people in Africa. If you have a vision, any vision that you have for any business that you want to do, wherever you are in the world, take that vision and business to Africa. Africa is the place that's open for business. It's not going to be easy, but if you move in the correct manner, meet a couple people and things like that, don't just run and jump in the deep end. I guarantee you that you would be more successful with that business in Africa than you would be in the West. Because what you'll have is less competition. You'll be able to do manufacturing. Anybody who wants to do manufacturing, think about Africa first to help and assist our people because they are very capable and very willing to assist you in developing it if you come with a correct idea and enough funds to, to execute the idea. I, I, I've been to um, the, my, I've been going to Africa since the 90s. My first time in Africa was May of um, I think it was May of is it May? No, June June of I think it was 93, something like that. I went to Kemet. was the first place I went to um, in Africa. And after going there that time, I did a few trips there. I've been came at nine times. And then I traveled to the west of Africa, to the Gambia, to Syria, um, to Senegal, and then to Ghana. If I could live in Africa now, I 100% would. What I would say to young people between the ages of, say, 18 to 35, if you don't have children, or even if you have children or young, go to Africa and look at opening doors in Africa. Believe me, any idea you have, you can materialize it in Africa. Definitely. Shit. Okay. Shit.
Oh, so, <laughs> rise up, rise up, Prophet. Absolutely have to agree with you. Just want to share a little bit about my experience of the trips that we did to Zimbabwe. Uh, three years running, uh, we carried a total of about 100 people now to uh, Zimbabwe. And it's a beautiful country, a beautiful country. But as Dr. Abu has already touched on, the power of the media you know, to shape your mind about the, a country cannot be, you know, underestimated. I mean, the media is so powerful that it will convince you and convince even the people who are living in the country that the supermarket shelves are empty when in fact the supermarket shelves are, are really full. And, you know, the, 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 the power of the media in, in Zimbabwe has been, you know, overwhelming for decades because they have been, you know, consistent in, in abusing the former president, you know, um, uh, President, M president Mugabe while he was alive. I mean, even while we were out there, we would see really awful headlines um, about the president and how he even allowed, you know, all of those press to report in such a derogatory way about him. You know, I, I don't think most leaders would have allowed it. But imagine growing up in a country where for 30 years, the headlines that you have been reading about your president is suggesting that he's incapable of managing the economy, the economy is sinking, uh, the, the, uh, everything's gone to pot, the, the education is poor, the roads, roads is poor, and everything's really awful. And this is what these newspapers have been writing. Obviously, Western uh, journalists have been writing in the country for decades. And, and all of that misinformation really just plays on the minds of the people to the extent where a lot of Zimbabweans uh, have left the country and are working in high positions all around the world. And even though Zimbabwe was one of supposed to be, you know, the highest educated, uh, you know, people in the whole of Africa, and when we went there, the economy was working really well. You know, the systems were working well. People were very professional in the jobs that they were doing. The roads, some of the best roads you'd see, you know, anywhere in Africa, you know, the uh, the tourists tourist opportunities there the history that it's got the great kingdom of zimbabwe musuya tunya uh, the the rocks and the mountains and you know it's just phenomenal the wildlife the safari they've got it all the lakes it's absolutely beautiful but you know the power of the media is such that it can even convince those who are living there you know that they're living in you know the pits or something like that when in fact, you know, it's better than the UK. I would say, you know, that country runs more efficiently, more effectively. The agriculture is what they've got thousands, tens of thousands of farmers actually farming out there. You know, it's all going on. But yet the level of discontentment is so, so high because, you know, the media has been able to psychologically brainwash the majority of people into believing that there's nothing good about the country. And so we've really got to overcome, I think all of us, the power of the media. We've got to take back control of our own mind so that we can see for ourselves the beauty that you know Prince Dinus was talking about, the beauty of Africa. As he's saying, we've all got these smartphones now. We we can just Google, you know, the city, images of the cities of all of these different African uh, capital cities now, the different African countries, to see for ourselves the beauty of Africa. I remember when I first did that exercise with some young people, they couldn't believe that the cities that I was actually showing them were cities in Africa, you know? And so we've got to continue to promote the beauty of Africa and to tell our own stories. It's so, so important. Uh, Prince Dinus, let me go back to you to contribute some more to um, uh, the story that we're telling about the importance of the role, you know, of us as the diaspora, one to promote Africa, to promote trips to Africa, to promote the business opportunities in Africa, to promote the return to Africa, to bring back our skills and our talents. Brother, over to you. Sell Africa to the people. Yeah, I mean, Africa is our is our birthright. But at the same time, what people have to understand uh, currently, 
you know, you know, as you go to Africa and you'll, you'll notice this, you have an influx of Europeans, you have an influx of Chinese, you have an influx of Lebanese. So even though it's your birthright, you know, your birthright is also for sale. And, you know, no one's going to, you know, no government or no people, well, sorry about that, no government or no people are going to uh, wait on you or, sorry, no, no government or no people are going to uh, wait on you, uh, are going to wait on you or hold your, uh, your, uh, your birthright for you, reserve it for you until you get your mind right and decide that one day you want to go to Africa and, and claim your birthright or get involved. So that's the thing. It is your birthright, but your birthright is for sale. So that's why, you know, it's important to have an Africa plan, the, the develop an Africa plan and go and contribute and build and claim your birthright. Because like I said, it's, it's, it's definitely up for sale. So, But meanwhile, we're, you know, we're in the West fighting for something that would never truly be ours. It would never be ours. So, you know. True. Mm. For real, for real, brother Dinus. Uh, Dr. Abu, please come in. No, no, what the brother says true now, you know, Prophet says something earlier on about, about the reggae music. You see, all of those, you know, is part of the scramble of Africa, you know, just like how jazz finds its way with Louis Armstrong. You understand? The arts is finding its way. You understand, you know? But the people, you understand, you know, the people doesn't understand that when these people scramble for Africa, it wasn't hunger people that were scrambling alone. They were scrambling our hearts. Mm -hmm. And today, some of us in the West, why well, I mean, I like jazz, you know, because I mean, I like, no, 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 no. That's not us. We have to compliment all of those things that come out of Africa and support the brother there with his hip hop. So you understand? And this is where this is where we get it wrong. And if we're gonna go back into Africa with the mindset of the European, then I'm telling you, blood, <laughs> we in trouble because you I have many here in the UK, blood. You know, and I I would rather I would rather stand on the airport and take them out before then before them enter the plane. You understand? Because some virus I go back, blood. You understand? And we have to be real. You know, so we have to organize ourselves. You know, see. Because instead of we going back to with nation building, we are going back with a, a, a lot of colonial virus here. We got to organize. Mm -hmm. Not to organize. Vodom. Vodom, rise up, Dr. Abu. Absolutely. We've got to leave the colonial mindset behind. Leave the colonial virus behind. Most definitely. And uh, there's a huge amount of work that needs to be uh, done. Need to look into the history of Liberia as well. I was watching one of your interviews, uh, 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 Dinus, uh, with a brother who's in Liberia at the moment, and uh, all of what oh. he was saying about, yeah, Liberia there. But it has a history as well that we've got to learn from. So much so, you know, we can't return and then, you know, just be walking in the shoes of the former colonizers and think we're going to lord over, you know, the Africans far from it. We have to organize to work in partnership with and alongside with <clears throat> our brothers and sisters on the continent. So, you know, to those who have posted in the chat that they're already embarking on projects in Ghana and other parts of Africa, big up yourself. I mean, that's what we need to do. We need to work in partnership partnership, business partnerships, voluntary organizational partnerships, uh, partnerships with schools, colleges, universities, you know, complement what's happening where we can. Absolutely agree with that. And, uh, you know, when we go over there in our business communities, we need to be looking to see what we can contribute towards the local communities as well. Uh, and so that, you know, they can see that we've come to work alongside to build. We are the descendants of those ancestors of theirs that were taken away. And, uh, you know, we're coming to help with the building and the reconstruction and the redevelopment of uh, Mama Africa. And we're going to do that together, most definitely. Uh, Prophet uh, Kwaku, back at ya. Yeah, you. Yeah, you know, um, we must, when we're going back to Africa, 
we must go back to Africa with that mentality like you're going back to the Caribbean. Hmm. That way you will safeguard yourself. Because unfortunately for some of our brothers and sisters on the continent, they have been de deprived of many things. They've been deprived of their um, ability to have um, e-commerce. They've been deprived of have, um, being able to set up businesses, etc. And man, and one of the biggest problems in Africa is that not enough African countries are doing manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Manufacturing is a is a thing that we need to develop in Africa because it will make the economy grow. And it will give the people them a sense of purpose and desire. Because not everybody are creators. Some of, some of us just born to work for somebody else. It's just the nature of life. You understand yes, me? Yes. Mm -hmm. But if somebody's working for you, you've got to look after them. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. You have to allow them to be able to develop. Mm -hmm. What I see sometimes, one of the things I don't like about Africa the part of Africa I've been, is that in a lot of the places, they build these big prisons to live in. And I call them that because they build a beautiful home and then they build some big wall mound around it. You can't even see the house. Yeah, you have to open up the gate and see the house. Mm -hmm. So we're locking ourselves away from each other. And that's because the West has created deceit, treachery, and distrust in the continent is there. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. these are one of the things that we have to try to dispel. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, one of the first things that we created in Garvey Town was a school for children to assist in the African of the children because the school system in Africa don't teach the children about even where they live. Them, them, they, you, they know more about the colonial masters who was there land than they know more about their own land. So they grow with this, this desire. They want to, if them is in Cameroon, they want to go to France. If them mm. in a Senegal, they want to go to France. If them mm. in a Gambia, they want to come to Britain. If them in a Ghana, they want to come to Britain. If them there are Kenya, they want to come to Britain. You understand me? If them in Angola, mm. they want to go to Portugal. The men of the Congo, the one who go either France or Belgium. The men of Namibia, the one go Germany. You know, these are all the places that the colonial people them had. And so they impregnate the minds of our children with the fantasies and the brilliance that they think of their homeland. And so now you find that African children are calling Britain and places like that the motherland. Just like us in the Caribbean. You understand what I'm saying to you? So mm -hmm. um, Africa in our people is one of the key things that children them. The key is the children. It's not me. It's not Dr. Abu. It's not Brother Prince. It's not you, we, You know, we're of age now. It's not about us anymore. It's about those who's coming behind us. I try to teach my children them um, about Africa. I tell them anything they want to do. They must look to Africa. But even in your own home, you have problems with your children because the system where you live is so powerful. You understand? And they know how to go in the roundabout way of brain dirtying our people. So the key is to africate our children them about the beauty of Africa. Like Brother Amir was saying about the beauty of Sierra Leone. You understand what I'm saying? Africa is the most prettiest continent on the planet. It's just that we don't get the opportunity to see it. Mm -hmm. Otep. Otep, rise up, rise up, Prophet. Absolutely uh, agree with you on that. Lots of comments about what you were saying uh, about the wars. Lots of comments in the chat. Uh, people agreeing with you. And uh, Everton uh, Riddle saying, yeah, it's like uh, blocking out yourself from your own people and uh you know a few other people's commenting about the great war the this person that everton was saying yeah totally agree with you uh Kweku, uh this great war doesn't uh go with me and um you know and it's so true and i've seen it and i've looked at it and i thought to myself you know okay um i can understand wars as a as a 
um, means of defense. If we go back uh, in time into history, uh, there's a lot of documented evidence and ruins that show that we used to build city walls, you know, great city walls. And within the city walls, then there would be no walls. There would People would be living, you know, in their homes, in their houses, in their palaces, in their, in their huts, whatever it is they lived in. They would be living within the city walls. Uh, but, you know, I agree. I think that this idea of building a wall around your home has come with the colonialists because they know they come uh, with the, they came as evil, wicked, genocidal maniacs. I think they lived in fear that one day the Africans would, as we did in the Caribbean, hmm. you know, come and burn them out of their houses. And so they built these great walls around them. And, uh, you know, and I think that we have, you know, as Africans kind of copied that style and that design now. And, I'm not entirely in agreement with that. That's okay. Because in Jamaica, which I can speak for, mm -hmm. when people go back to Jamaica, they build jails for themselves. You know mm -hmm. what I mean by jails? Every house mm -hmm. has a brick. Yes. Yeah? And you've got these bars. I mean, they do them nicely, but it's to keep out the criminals. You mm -hmm. understand? So we are protecting ourselves from our own brothers and sisters. <laughs> and why is that? Because the West left the place in a mess. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. what they do, they come with them CIA agent and they create animosity yes. in the country. Mm -hmm. So those people are not building down walls just you know, they're building the walls to protect themselves from criminals that will come and rob them. Because let's not be fooled. There's criminals in some of these countries that we that we got, and you have to be bloody mindful that mindful of them. I was talking to my brethren the other day who he went back to Nigeria for 10 years. And so one night in my drive home. And a man them pull him over and take a police. And a man them rob him, rob him at gunpoint. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is, is that the, the government as well of these countries, they've kept the countries in deprivation for so long that the people have now implored on themselves. You over some I said. Mm -hmm, so when mm -hmm. they see us come there, love them, they, they, they're trying to look at us. What is it that we love so much? Them want, them want to leave. You see, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so it's a two-way process mm. of trying to africate the people them and reason with them, because the because they've left the economies weak, and so the people them are not able to benefit from what is being stolen from the economies, it creates that criminal tendency in the country. So these are other aspects that we've got to look at in trying to assist developing um, the various parts of Africa that we may deem to go to. I just wanted to say that point there, sis. So yes, uh, I hear that point, um, uh, Prophet. And, um, you know, those bars and those prison bars that you talked about, you know, we can see that uh, across Africa as well. And, you know, I, in my opinion, I think that that also was uh, something that was introduced into Africa by um, the colonizers. Again, to protect themselves, I think, initially from us, because when we read in history, remember, they used to report that there were no jails in Africa. You know, the, the king's doors were open. The palace's uh, doors were open. You know, uh, the wealthy fed the poor, uh, the, the poor that were among us. There was, you know, people just didn't steal or thieve. But you see, the crooks that came in, the big old teeth, them that come in with the intention to rob and steal and murder, you see, they had to protect, in my opinion, themselves. And for the last 200 years or so that they've been building uh, here on the continent, in, in my view, I, as I look around, I think to myself, this just doesn't feel Africa. Some places you go, it's more West than the West. Or you would think that you're in the West. They've actually created the West in Africa. And we have to look to the ruins to see how we used to live. And when we look to the ruins to see how we used to live, there's a little bit left in Africa, which is the kind of compound thing. The huge families, you know, with their different houses, 
you know, um, that still exists. If we go to East Africa and, you know, we go around Kilwa and Tanzania and those places, we can see the huge arches and the huge compounds and, you know, prison bars never used to be there. The huge walls within the city, in my opinion, never need to be there. And I think this is a journey that we need to go on to go back to where we were because we need to overcome what you were saying, my brother, Prophet, you know, the, 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 evil, crooked elements that the West have introduced uh, into Africa. So, yeah, we, uh, it's, we maybe can't just immediately get rid of the, the, the bars and the walls because it would make us then probably target, I think, you know, for the wicked criminal elements that are there. Uh, so, you know, but we need to then take over the education and start africating our people, you know, to bring that, that the, the Ma'at principles and the way that we used to live together. I think there's definitely a work, a huge job that needs to be done so that we can get back to where we were uh, as a people before, you know, the Neanderthal descendants actually came in and invaded uh, our lands. But uh, in terms of opportunities, on the motherland, family, phenomenal opportunities. Our brothers was talking about the need for industrialization. I mean, everything, well, not everything, to a large extent, what I see on the continent is what the Europeans have brought, their infrastructure and all of the infrastructure that they have built basically leads to Europe. Everything was designed to support Europe, yeah? Um, the airway lines, the railway lines, the port, everything was shipping everything out from Africa to Europe. And now we've got to change all of that because we've got to start building the industries and making use of the raw materials on the continent. And, you know, I say to people, if you can get any engineering training, science training, technological training, if you've already got those skills and training, bring it to Africa. The opportunities are here. It's like Africa's like virgin lands, ready for redevelopment, ready, you know, and waiting for um, the children that were taken away to return and to contribute towards our growth and development. And you've heard, you know, about how beautiful Africa is. I mean, those of you who've checked out my channel, you will see that, you know, a couple of strongs ago on Sunday, we were cruising on the Gambian River. We're having, you know, river parties and we're out at the beach on a Sunday and during the week if we want to. You know, there's no signs of COVID around here. It's a completely different lifestyle. Time to come home, family. Let me go over to uh, Prince Dinas to contribute some more to the conversation that we're having. Then background to Dr. Abu and Prophet. Prince Dinas, Amir. Uh, yeah, I mean, only the only suggestion I could give, advice I could give now is if you haven't been to the continent, just go, just you know, spin the, spin the, uh, just close your eyes and you know, just put spin the globe and make sure it's on Africa and just point, use your finger and just point a country and just go, you know, just just go visit. Well, avoid the northern Arab Arabized countries in North in, in North Africa, but. Mm -hmm. Our stuff to here in Africa. I mean, it's just close your eyes, find a map Ooh. of Africa, put your finger there, and just and just go. You know, we don't want to overcomplicate it. And I think sometimes um, when it comes to traveling to Africa, a lot of people like to overcomplicate it. They like to treat it like they're going to the moon for some reason. So, you know, just buy a ticket, especially in the UK. So the UK, you have an advantage because out of you know France, out of the well, out of the UK, of course, well, if you're in Europe, I'm sorry, you have an advantage because out of the UK, out of France, you can pretty much catch a direct flight to way more countries in Africa than we can in America. Out of America, we pretty much fly direct uh, to I think South Africa, Accra, Lagos, Lome, Abidjan, and Dakar. But I know, um, and I'm sorry, now Nairobi in Cairo, uh, from what I believe, but you know, if you're in if you're in Europe, I mean, you guys could pretty much fly direct to anywhere in, in, on the continent, you know, especially out of uh, Paris and Brussels and in the UK. So, so yeah, just um, pick a country and go. Pick a country and go. Mm. Mm. Okay, I, 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 I heard I is correct. Uh, heard everything our brother had to say. Okay, I've got a bit of poor connection going on here. 
so I'm kind of yeah, bro, hearing. Brother Prince was saying, what, Sister Shanice. He, he was saying, just, just uh, you know, for people who's watching, who's never been to Africa, just take a dive, spin it on, on the continent of Africa and just go. And and you know what, my king? You're correct, because the first time I ever, ever went to Africa, that's what I did. That's the f first thing I did. I said, right, I've been reading about Egypt. May I go to Egypt? I'm going to take up on me, just go. Boom, just, just so, so, so. You understand what I'm saying? When I went to um, um, Gambia, I went by myself. I didn't. I didn't even have a hotel book. I just jump on the plane and I just go. And when we land, when we land at Banjul Airport, I'm gonna jump on it. I said, "Just take me somewhere where me not see no white people." <laughs> I'm gonna take me to a place in in, in Fajara. And I do this. I'm gonna go rest out. You see my deal with when you when you. Africa will call you, you know. You see, if 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 you're in a liberation struggle, yeah. and you read and said, one day Africa will call you. You will hear the call, and when you hear it, you forgot. When you hear it, you forgot. Here, that's your ancestors calling. You understand me? I was talking to my queen the other night about uh, about it. She was telling me about her experience when she went. To Ghana, and she went down. Um, she went to Elamina, um, um, dungeon, mm. and she just start ball like profusely. But that was her ancestors in her crying, so them come back home. You understand me? So, uh, uh, so Africa will call you. To, we, just like um, what, what Prince and um, Prince Danis said earlier. Stop going to Europe on holiday. Spain and all of them eat that place there. Remember, you know, Gambia is only a five-hour flight. Five hours. Ghana is six hours. Egypt is about the same, is about the same five hour. It takes no time to get to them place there, you know. Buffum and you're there. By the time you close your eye, you wake up, you're there at Banjo Airport. You understand me, I say? When, when I went to when I went to Ghana in 2019, was it 2019? Yeah, 2019. When I went back to Ghana again, I went for two weeks and spent two months. <laughs> when I land at the airport, uh, uh, um, 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 uh, at the airport in Accra, I want the most sophisticated airport me ever passed through. It, it, it make Gatwick can eat you look, look, look like some little joke thing. Mm -hmm. You understand what I said? So people who have this assumption about what Africa is like is because don't the, the only time I'm sure you have good, a good part of Africa is when David Attenborough do I do, I do one wildlife thing and it's only the wildlife you see. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So my my message is to young people, young African men and women. Who are between the ages of 18 to 35. I uno forgot that. Because uno have the vision. Uno have um, certain skills that you can transmit. I make uno a bag of money for that uno a look. Uno me a talk to. And go as a collective. Don't go as a singular. You understand me? I say, try to be community, community orientated. Cause that's what we were originally, community orientated. Mm -hmm. Otep. Otep, rise up, rise up, Prophet Doctor Abu. Oh. Let's yeah, hear man, from good you. Um, you know, the good question on. you ask, the question you ask, how can diaspora contribute towards Africa rising? There's pollution in Africa. I wanna go back to Africa to build on pollution. You go in at the Gambia in, in Bakate dump. You know the dump in a, in a the Gambia there where the people them the people them can't even drink the water because it's like the, the dump poison the water. So these are the things then where we have to work with the people them down there to make sure the environment is good. Because as I said. 
going back to Africa, to me, is totally integration with the African people. You understand? You know, I now go in Africa for go have a little Jamaican community up there, so I know about them. I know none of them thing the blood. You understand? You know, I know look at New York, now look at New York, even down there. So, no, 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 colonialism that. You know, we're glad to integrate with them, with the European, them in America, in Europe, and them places. But when we go to Africa, we, we think that we, we, we need this separation. And that is not good. That's why I said. We have to organize ourselves. Got to organize ourselves. You don't see it because if we don't organize ourselves, you have vultures in Africa that will rip you apart, blood. You understand? Because of the colonialism. You understand? If you don't organize yourself, you can be sell on to the Arabs because the slave trade is still going on in a different way. You don't see it. So let's not kid ourselves. And things that they are Romans, Africa, because I'm not a Roman. I'm an African. You understand? Right. And for what and for what we've been <clears> through <throat> here in the West, that I'm telling you, they say once bitten, twice shy. You understand? I hear your sister Shanice, you know. I hear you on the boat ride, you know. I'm skeptical of boat ride. The last time we were planning a boat ride after now, I reach back home yet. <laughs> 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 oh. oh, it was beautiful. I think Sister Shinis does a show up from a doctor about boat, boat ride from um, 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 the Gambian River and all them something there. River Gambian and all them something. I live at the Shatek man, because we're down here in, in, below zero. And below zero <laughs> down here, you know. Them <laughs> come out, come out to me, you know. me the day, uh, icicles, may, may, may I say. Wow. <laughs> I'm hearing, I'm seeing the images of the snow, you know, and uh, I'm hearing how cold it is below freezing, you know, and I'm ferreting that, you know, and not them type of temperature we're supposed to be living in, you know, we are children of the sun, you know, we're supposed to be in the sun getting our melanin top top. So I really feel it for the down there. And uh, when we ask, uh, I'm trying to show the family, you know, there's a different kind of, quality of life and lifestyle, you know, that we could be enjoying here uh, in Africa. They're not telling us about the beautiful blue sky, the, the sunshine, the palm trees, the warmth of the people, you know, and, and everything that we can enjoy. Of course, there's work to do here. Dr. Abu is just talking about some of the works that need doing, you know, and we need to come and help contribute towards that. We're coming from a place where, you know, they've got refuge disposable uh, systems in place. You know, they've got the refuge collection cart systems in place, the jobs and opportunities that, that, that is created there in that whole, you know, public health department to do with, um, you know, um, refuge collection and, and hygiene and, and all the and sanitation. It's a huge department that makes sure that all of that functions really well in the West. I remember when our parents came to the UKKK, these people used to make them dog crap on the road, them used to throw them <laughs> dirty up in our kind of thing out of the window. You can walk the street here for dirt and filth. It's only in the 80s when Maggie Thatcher come along and start top or clean up the place when the place start mm -hmm. look a little better. You know, mm -hmm. so I just the other day England fix up so much less Africa that's had 200 years of oppression and exploitation and, and feed them foolishness for deal with. They've been using Africa. Africa and abuse in Africa as their backyard, as we know. Their toxic waste, their pollution, they dump it in our seas. You know, they come with all of their toxic poisons and they bury it in the Sahara and people start suffering from cancers. They come with all of their poison vaccine and everything them no want, all them food, them salt and them plastic rice and everything end up here. It's a whole heap of cleaning up we have to do around here. But are we, I feel, I forget involved to make that happen. Because we can see with our third eye where really are gone and what is missing. So a whole heap of works for do, for real. But in between the work, you can have your boat trip and you can enjoy the beach and, you know, uh, everything is everything, you know? So we can go around again. Oh, Brother Davis. Oh, I wanted to ask, um, I wanted to ask Brother Prince, Dennis, 
a question. Brother Prince, could you explain to us what was your what was your first feeling when you touched down the very first time went in Africa? I want I want to know how you felt when you first when you first touched down. So so the first country I, I traveled to was uh, this was 2011. I went to Tanzania, and you know I remember I flew. In fact, I flew from LA to Heathrow on American Airlines, and then from Heathrow straight to Dar es Salaam on uh, British Airways. And I remember, you know, I think they just recently renovated uh, Julius Nairi Airport in Dar es Salaam. But when I went, it was it was trash. I mean, just to be honest. So I remember we we pull up, you know, we get out, and so this is the first time ever that I ever arrived to an airport where you didn't pull in into the, uh, it's like you actually had to walk on the mm. tarmac into the- uh, Terminal. I mean, yeah, into the terminal instead of going in through the, uh, uh, what's it called when you, help me out. The turnstiles. Oh, no, 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 no. When you, when you, you know, usually when you like Heathrow, when you, when the plane taxis and you get out the plane, you go in through like the little tunnel thing, whatever it's called. Yeah, the tunnel to them, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, this is the first time there was like they they landed, and I'm like, okay, are they gonna pull into the the tunnel thing or whatever? It said, nah, get out. So we walked out, and we walked on the tarmac into the uh, into the uh, you know visa control and passport control or passport control, whatever. So I get inside the airport. It's no AC. It's hot as hell. Hella hot, as they're saying, Cali. You know, I'm there like an hour because I got my visa on arrival. I get my bags. I go out. And then the, that that African heat just hits me in the face. Yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. like I'm, I'm standing outside and uh, at the airport waiting for my ride to come get me from the hotel. And um, you know, you know, you know, when you walk outside of the African airport, they're selling sim cars, they're selling this, selling that. Mm. But I noticed they were coming up to me, and they were speaking Swahili, mm. and. Because they, they they assumed that I was you know from Dar es Salaam. That's from, right. Was, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Right. And I was like, uh, I only speak English. And then they asked, okay, are you South African? I said no. They said, are you Nigerian? Which I am now. But at the time, I was like, no. They said, are you Ghanaian? I said no. They're like, well, where are you from? I said, I'm from America. They're like, oh, okay. Well, welcome home, brother. And so you know they. they home and you know we started talking and it's just i don't know it's just when i walked outside of the airport with my bags and that he hit me it was just like the the, the feeling was surreal yes, and then when yes. they came up to me and um uh, you know they started chatting with me and talking with me and you know i hopped in my cab and i'm riding through the city you know my hands out the window you know and i'm just i'm just i'm just absorbing everything like i'm like oh man this is it was just like i said it's a surreal experience like it was just surreal. Like I'm like I'm I'm here in Africa. Like I'm here. Like I can't, I can't believe it. Like I had to pitch myself. Like I'm here, but it, like I just, you know, it's, it, it's something that you won't breezeway. That's what it's called. It's called a breezeway. Um, but, but it's something that until you go, like you won't understand. Like I can't really articulate the experience. It's just one of those things. Like you have to go yourself and experience. Then you'll. You'll get it, and uh, uh, you'll then understand what uh, that feeling I'm talking about. Because, like I said, when you walk outside the airport, and I just remember just kind of just looking around, and he hit me. I'm like, "Oh man, I'm in Africa. I'm here." And they came running. Up, they came up to me and started talking to me in Swahili, and then they told me, "Welcome home, brother." And I just start walking around, and yeah, it's just it's it's a surreal experience. Mm -hmm. man. You only get experience until you or understand or relate to once you go. So. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, I I, I, I I remember that. I remember that very same feeling. Um, the, the heat hit you is a, is a different... I tell you, the hottest place in Africa I've ever been, though, was Egypt. Uh -huh. Um, I went to Egypt. One year I went there. It was in June. And I've never felt heat like that in my life, ever. Right. I went, I went, I went further south, near enough to um, Abu Simbo. And... Um, we was in, we was in uh, Aswan, and we was on a coach. Me and my brother, we dip on a coach, and we were the only two black people on this coach. Mm. And the coach pull up um at this place where they have the unfinished ticket. And when the man opened the the, the, the um the door, the heat 
the it. The white people came off the coach and they walked back on the coach. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. right. When, and it was only me and my bridging that could walk down to the tech end. We walked down to the tech, the unfinished tech end. And they were on the coach watching us. And when we came back, they said, we wish we were black. Because that's how, I never felt eat like that before, ever. Not in Jamaica. I never felt eat like that in Ghana, not in Gambia. I mean, this eat was severe. <laughs> it, was, it, it, was, it was severe. The eat, that eat there in Egypt that year there. June, it was about June, July, I got on there. One at a time when we got on there. And we were just visiting the places that we were going to take the people to when we bring them down a few months later. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, but spiritually, if you go to Africa with that open spirit, you're going to have an experience like you've never had before. Right. Yeah. There, there are other parts on the planet that have beautiful scenery and things like that. But you see, especially those of us who are children of the kidnapped people, we're going back with hundreds of years of ancestral DNA in us. That when we touch down, it's a, it's a serious vibe that you get. Africa for the Africans, doors are warm and doors are broad. Udum. For real, vodom, vodom, uh, profit, and uh, you know the other panelists on that. Uh, family who are watching in the chat, if you have any questions that you'd like to put to any members of the panel, uh, now is your opportunity uh, to do so. Uh, we've got Sister V who is asking, uh, were there any crocodile hippos in the river? Uh, uh, when we did our boat trip. Okay, uh, on the part of the uh, river that I sailed down, no, there were no crocodiles or hippos, but I do know of another cruise that uh, another group went on and it was much further out and they actually spent a weekend away and there was this big um, uh, cultural celebration that was happening and they did talk about seeing hippos in the water. And, uh, and I do know that there is a place that I've been to previously in uh, the Gambia where they do have a lot of crocodiles. So they are here, but they weren't on the part of the Gambian River where we had our riverboat uh, cruise. And yes, oh my days, the Zambezi River in Zimbabwe, the sunset on that river, the color of it is like the orange in the background of uh, this this uh, set that we're looking at right now, absolutely beautiful, and uh, it has a little islands there, and they had uh, elephants on the island and hippos in the water. We didn't see any crocodiles, though I didn't, but absolutely beautiful. Okay, let me go to the uh, chat and see what questions you've got that you would like to put to our panel members. Uh, we are coming up to the last fifteen minutes of our show here today. I want to thank you also so much, you know, for keeping it locked. Uh, we've got just under 200. Uh, my mm. internet allows. Uh, so this one is uh, saying, well, this is a comment to say that uh, from Christelle, who said, yeah, I had the same feeling when I went to Egypt. Uh, Cecilia is saying, yes, brother Amir. Oh, we lost our sister, I think. Yeah, we lost his um, sister. She needs um, her power must mm -hmm. um, must have gone. But I think she was saying that somebody said, "Yes, brother Amir, what is the link <laughs> for your third ebook?" Um, so you can go to uh, dynastymir.com and everything will be there. You can go to uh, dynastymir.com and everything will. You can find everything there. Dynastymir.com. So my first name, last name, dot com. Oh, you're back with us, sister um, Janice. Yes, them try to kick me mm -hmm. off, but we come back again. Mm -hmm. yes. but it's been good. It's been good considering we had no internet at all whatsoever for the whole of yesterday, right through to about eight o'clock in the evening. It came on for two hours. It was off again all night, and it came back this morning just in time for my Galaxy show. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's been off and on throughout the day today, but it's doing 
quite well. So for those in the family who have got, you know, internet skills, we need your skills over here in the Gambia. It's absolutely ridiculous. I'm told by the engineers that they actually get their feed from Portugal. You know, what are we doing getting our internet feed uh, from Portugal? Or having I'll tell you what that is, Sister Shanice. Communications controlled by them. Yes, brother, um, Prophet. Um, what, what it is, is that... Um, they're using um, Portugal satellite. Cause every country, every, every country, them have them own satellite to feed them <coughs> thing, you know. Mm. Yeah? I think I think Nigeria, Nigeria have them own satellite to feed for them internet system, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, for and change. Maybe, yeah, mm -hmm. but but that's the kind of technology that we need to. Um, we need people who's got that kind of skill to come to Africa and develop it for us. You know what I mean? You know, we, mm. we shouldn't have to be depending on on on, on um, foreign forces um, to to feed us internet. That's madness. Mm -mm. So that's the kind of investment that we need. And 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 like what Brother May said, you know, if the Africans them with money in the diaspora don't invest in Africa, our enemies will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And are doing. Absolutely agree with you. Uh, Simon is confirming that Africa does have its own satellite. So why are we not, you know, um, supporting the African satellite instead of getting our feed, you know, from, from Europe? What that, I mean, it's such a vulnerable position as Africans to be in. It means that they can cut off our communication supply at any time they choose to do so. And we're in a situation where, you know, our army, our intelligence, you know, our government just are unable to communicate. It's a very vulnerable situation to be in indeed. And, um, you know, as brother, um, our brother Prophet was saying, uh, if we're not investing in Africa, we can be sure that uh, those who don't look like us, don't like us, who are already in Africa will continue to do so. Let me just tell you a little bit about what I've got here about on the scramble for Africa. It says, companies listed on the London Stock Exchange control, and this is just a London Stock Exchange, control over $1 trillion worth of Africa's resources and in just five commodities, oil, gold, diamonds, coal, and platinum. It says, research for the NGO, War on Want, a published report reveals that 101 companies, most of them British, control over 305 billion worth of platinum, $276 billion worth of oil, $216 billion worth of coal at current market prices. The scramble for Africa is proceeding at a pace with the results that African governments have largely basically handed over their treasure to them. Of the 101 London-based listed companies, 25 are actually incorporated in tax havens, principally the British Virgin Islands. It is estimated that Africa loses around 300, sorry, 35 billion a year, I'm sure it should be trillion, a year in multinational company profits from operations in Africa. Now, what we can see from that is one, you know, that Africa is a very lucrative place, you know, for so-called, um, they call themselves investors, but they're looters, yeah? It's a lucrative place for these looting companies, yeah? And they're gonna continue looting until we, the diaspora, come in and help, you know, uh, the, the, the locals on the ground, you know, to start building our own industries and elbowing out those multinationals who are continuing to rape and pillage the continent. Uh, we are, time is running away around the table. Dr. Abu, let's have some words from you in terms of the need for us to make a move to do what needs to be done. Uh, because when we look at the way things are going at the moment, more of the same, in my opinion, is just not an option. What say you, Dr. Abu? Well, the first time I go into Africa was 1986 in Sudan. And the thing, the thing that still stick in my mind is the beauty of those women. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. The beauty of those African women. You know, and that's what we must bear in mind. That we are beautiful people. You know, man and woman, we are wonderful people. And we have to just travel with that wonderful feeling. And as I said, when I go to Africa, I don't vacate the plantation. I go from home to home. Mm-hmm. And then anytime we go to Africa on vacation, we go as a little European. And we must always link with a family in Africa. That we can leave some clothes down there. That's when we go down, we now put our new clothes every day. Mm-hmm. You understand? We must stop, go down there and propagate the life on our people there. You know, see it, you know? When I go to the Caribbean, I always put on one of my brother's trousers. You understand? Because I realize that the lie, the lie that we perpetrate, sometimes we don't even know that a lie we are telling. But we lie to the people them. Psychologically, because we are not going back with an African mind. We are going with a vacation mind. Voodoo mind. Voodoo. Voodoo. Rise up, rise up, uh, Dr. Abu. And uh, let's go to our guest, uh, Prince Dinas, Amir. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's just now it's about action and uh, uh, getting to the continent, not overcomplicating everything, not overcomplicating uh, getting there. Uh, just go buy that ticket, go visit, go immerse yourself, go have fun, go enjoy yourself. And and, and the great thing, and also I would recommend uh, before you go to a country, once you decide which country you're going to go to, link up with the diaspora from that country that's in your country that you're in currently right now. Um, so do that. And I mean, it's all it's the time of action is now. So go make that journey. I mean, let's just get to it. Absolutely. Uh, now is the time for action. Uh, profit. If you, you, you're going back, to visit is one thing. But always try to go back and bring a book. Mm. Bring a, a book by one of our African scholars and, and, and give to them to read. Yeah, because man. a lot of these books they don't get access to. And even sometimes when we go to some of the countries, we know more about the historical right. day of the country than the actual people that live there. Because they're not taught about their story. They taught about whichever colonial master was in that country, their history. You understand what I'm saying to you? And they don't teach the true history, the true history of them coming there to pillage, rape and murder and create um, anarchy in Africa amongst African people. If the Africans on the continent put down their differences and other truth and reconciliation with themselves instead of having truth and reconciliation with white people, yeah, then those powers that be would not have the foothold in Africa they have today. I can almost guarantee that. They would not have that foothold they have in Africa today. So Africans, wake up. The time of your sleeping is over. It's time to take over and rule and control your, our resources for the benefit of our people. Otep. Otep, rise up, rise up. Let me just look to the chat to see what uh, questions we've got in here. It's a question for you, Prophet. What type of manufacturing did you have in mind when you suggested uh, manufacturing is needed? And uh, why have they not? Uh, invested in this industry like China has, you know, everything made in China? Well, there's all, t- all types of manufacturing from manufacturing broom, hoover, vacuum cleaner, electric kettle, you know, um, solar, um, solar panels, you know, manufacturing of all types, manufacturing shea butter in the different types of things that shea butter is used. Because what they do, they collect the shea butter from there and they manufacture it and sell it back to them as cream and ear oil and, and all them things there. The palm, the palm oil, the pineapple, the coconut. 
all these other natural things that you can manufacture and you know the black soap and export it to the world that's what needs to happen it's that type of manufacturing creative manufacturing of all sorts that's what makes um that's what makes a country that's what's made the west um um, um financially astute because what they did they took the natural material out of the continent continent and they manufactured it right they take the coltan out of the congo they manufacture computers microchips um, um smartphones uh, um um television um screens all kind of something that's what in coltan that's what we're talking about apparently in rwanda now they're starting to manufacture mobile phones right yeah. that's what we need to be doing that type of money to put the people that have that technological um knowledge bring that that may attack both for real uh my screen froze for a moment hopefully i'm not talking on top of anybody um thank you thank you profit so we need industries right across the board Yes, indeed, in the agricultural sector, in the housing, in the, in the food, you know, in every sector. It looks as though my internet's uh, starting to play up. We are five minutes away from the top of the hour. Let's see if we can make it through the last five minutes. Uh, there's a couple of questions in the chat about the no, Asian... We're two, minutes from the, we're two minutes from the top of the hour, sis. Yeah, we're two minutes. We're two minutes from the top of the hour. Yeah, yeah. We're two minutes from the top of the hour. Is that brother Amir? You want you want to say something, Miss? You you want to close up, my brother? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, everyone, just thank you for uh, having me on. Uh, really means a lot. Uh, make sure you go to dynastamir.com. You can go to dynastamir.com. Uh, that's the best way to reach me. Also, uh, subscribe to my. YouTube page. Uh, it is in search of Uhuru. Again, in search of Uhuru here on YouTube. So check that out. And until next time, family. You're getting a lot of people calling you now, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I got. I forgot to turn the the ringer off. I apologize. So yeah. But hey, thank you for having me on. And until next time, family. Peace. Yeah, peace. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Give thanks. I share. I share. I share. I share. Yeah, I share. Rise up. Rise up. You know, beauty, beauty, you know? You know, rise up, rise up to our brother Jamas, you know? Miss him. Come in with me to lick mm. some shots. After, you know, see? So, mm -hmm. rise up, profit. It's a shinies, you know? Yeah, right, every time. Uh, we'll be back next strong. So, yes, looking mm. forward to his interjection next strong uh, as well. Wonderful. So, I'm back well, just in You look, hey, hey, sister Shanice. You look mm -hmm. radiant in your yellow and blue, do you know I tell the truth, man? Your skin has shine to that back. Thank you, my brother. <laughs> your skin has shine, sunshine. This is what the Gambian sunshine, the African sunshine does for us, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, gives us the vitamin D, gives us the energy, you know? And uh, it's, it's just beautiful. Uh, family, if you can get out before the total lockdown, do get no, out. No, it's total lockdown. No, we can't go nowhere. It's total lockdown. <laughs> in terms of in terms of traveling out of Britain, it's a total lockdown. You can't fly nowhere. Them go out like they don't want us in their country. Mm. They don't know where we want to leave. Them lock down the country to stop us mm -hmm. from going. Yeah, they hear yeah, right, go. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Well, family, uh, those of you in the in the chat, I want to thank you all so, so much for keeping it locked with us here tonight. Uh, panel members, Dr. Mm -hmm. Abu, Prophet Maduti, uh, Brother uh, Amis, um, Dina Samir in his absence. Thank you all so, so much. Uh, family, mm -hmm. before you leave, please give us a thumbs up. We've got 200 watching. We should have 200 likes. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, Please, please do. More love, more power, and as Dr. Abu would always say, more wudum to the entire Woodle. family. Right. One love. Okay. Be black, next right. strong, same time here on the YouTube channel. And check us out on the Big G Galaxy Afiwi. I will be posting uh, the times of our shows and the link to our shows 
under the chat, okay? One love, family. Thank you, Dr. Abu and Prophet. Ashe. Ashe. Ashe.